This morning I'm going to go over a little bit about osteoporosis, and obviously this talk is way too big to, uh, to cover in its entirety in a little less than an hour. So what I'm going to do is try and approach some questions that are asked of me frequently by primary care physicians, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, patients, a lot of patient questions, and more recently, lawyers, uh, as you'll see, are beginning to factor into this, into this equation as well. Like any other chronic disease, you've got to love putting up statistics about chronic disease, same with diabetes, same with osteoporosis. The burden uh, of disease is huge, and this is a disability-adjusted uh, life years uh, in this country and Europe with various diseases. And you can see osteoporosis fracture is right up at the top of the list, and hip fracture is not far behind. So in terms of disability, uh, it's phenomenal what these diseases can do. The economic costs, not as great as if they're, if they're diabetic, but nevertheless, the costs are there. I think some striking statistics is that 50% of women and 25% of men over the age of 50 can expect to have an atraumatic fracture at some point in their life. And the problem here, particularly with hip fractures, is the mortality associated with it. Depending on who you read, anywhere up to 20, maybe 25% of these individuals with a hip fracture will be dead within a year, and over half of them are going to be disabled uh, thereafter. So it's a, it's a disabling problem when it happens. It's a common problem, uh, and it costs a lot of money. And again, like with the diabetes, uh, the baby boomers are aging up, and this is what we have to look forward to in the, in the not-too-distant future. Now, part of the problem, I mentioned this, hinted at it yesterday with the diabetes, part of the problem, again, is us with clinical inertia. Uh, it's actually interesting that less than 50% of women and less than 10% of men with atraumatic or osteoporotic fractures ever get evaluated or are much less treated for their osteoporosis. Uh, and in less than 25% of hip fracture victims are ever even put on calcium or vitamin D. This isn't the orthopedic surgeon's problem. They're the ones that are tasked with putting it all back together again. Uh, this is the problem of the primary care doc, the endocrinologist, the people who are looking after osteoporosis not doing anything. So please, uh, if, if nothing else, at the end of this talk, uh, realize that when fractures happen, particularly in older individuals, they need to be investigated, they need to be looked into, and we need to do something. We're not going to affect changes in the staggering numbers that are coming down the line unless we get up and start doing something about it. Fractures beget fractures. Uh, an asymptomatic vertebral fracture, think of all the lateral chest x-rays you're seeing, frequently you will see uh, atraumatic or uh, asymptomatic vertebral fractures. If you see one of those on an x-ray in an older individual, their risk of developing another fracture in the vertebra is increased fivefold. So just because they have one, they're at risk for developing it again in the future, and the risk of developing hip fracture is, is doubled uh, within the next three years if you see an atraumatic vertebral fracture on an x-ray. Think of all the x-ray reports you see from your radiologist, go looking at them. More often than not, you're going to see uh, an asymptomatic or an a, uh, a vertebral fracture the patient wasn't aware of that the radiologist didn't bother to call. And that has impact to that patient. So look at these x-rays yourself, particularly if you're suspicious, you'd be amazed at how many fractures you can pick up. And that is useful information for both you and the patient. Now, before going on and uh, talking a little bit about some of the problems we have, some of our newer treatments, I want to get us all on the same page. And when I'm talking about osteoporosis, what exactly am I talking about? What do I mean? And a diagnosis of osteoporosis is based on a bone density. You all know this, uh, normal bone density, a T-score is minus one or higher, osteopenia, a term that should be vanquished forever is a T-score of minus 1 to minus 2.5, and frank osteoporosis, by definition, is a T-score of minus 2.5 or lower. Now, a T-score compares that individual to a cohort of normal women, no women with normal bone density. These would be women in their, uh, their mid-30s. A Z-score is a different score, and it's one you need to be aware of. A Z-score compares that individual to an age-matched cohort. Very important, and I'll show you why here in a moment. But for the purposes of diagnosing osteoporosis, we, of course, use the T-score. This is what the WHO has accepted. Now, osteoporosis, by definition, is postmenopausal women or men over the age of 50 with a T-score of minus 2.5 or lower. Um, and this is in the total, the spine, the total hip, or the femoral neck. Sometimes you have to use the wrist, but for the most part, this is spine or in the hip. But this is what osteoporosis is, postmenopausal women, men over the age of 50. Osteopenia, minus 1 to minus 2.5, postmenopausal women, 
men over the age of 50. It's a terrible term, but nevertheless, this is what osteopenia is. You don't see 40-year-old women in here. You don't see 25-year-old men in here. You see postmenopausal women and uh, men over the age of 50. So the T-scores are preferred. Uh, the WHO densitometric classification is applicable when you have postmenopausal women or men over the age of 50 with that T-score in the ranges that I've shown you. Now, when do we use a Z-score? Uh, Z-scores are important in premenopausal women or men under the age of 50. Now we want to compare that individual to somebody in their own age. Uh, we want to avoid the T-scores, and we want to use this thing called the Z-score. And a Z-score of minus 2 or lower would be considered significant. Minus 2 and above would be considered uh, probably normal. So if you've got a lady, the question that came up, 46-year-old uh, lady who's menstruating, you can't use the T-score. Look at the Z-score in that individual. If it's minus 2 or lower, you're on to something. If it's minus 2 or above, then, uh, uh, then it's probably normal. We don't need to worry about it. So don't, di don't diagnose osteoporosis in, in men under the age of 50 on the basis of bone density criteria alone. You need other things to make that diagnosis. Incidentally, the WHO criteria can be applied to women in their 40s uh, as they're going through the menopausal transition. So if it's 45, 46, 47, and they're clearly in menopause, then we can use the T-score to diagnose osteoporosis. When do we check? Uh, what are the indications? And uh, this has been published by the National Osteoporosis Foundation, uh, and I would encourage you to go to their website. It's a great website. There's a lot of physician ma uh, material. It doesn't cost you anything. Just uh, go on to NOF. And basically, women over the age of 65 or men over the age of 70 uh, are entitled to be screened at least once. Postmenopausal women under the age of 65 with risk factors. Now, bear in mind, menopause is a risk factor. I don't know too many 60-year-old women who are still uh, menstruating. So women under the age of 65 with one other risk factor, menopause, smoking, on steroids, family history, previous fractures, all of those would be considered an indication to treat if that lady is under, or an indication to screen if that lady is under 65. Men or women uh, between 50 and 69, I'm sorry for the typo here, about whom you have a concern based on the risk factor profile, other risk factors uh, mandate that maybe we should be screening these individuals. Women in the menopausal transition, uh, if you have a concern, again, because of other risk factors, uh, that would be an indication to, to screen. If they have a fracture, fragility fracture already, and they're over the age of 50, there's an indication to screen. Adults with a disease condition associated with osteoporosis, primary hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, steroid use, uh, that would be considered an indication to screen. Uh, adults taking medications, steroids, number one on the list, um, uh, anti-seizure medications for a prolonged period of time, that might be an indication to go ahead and screen. Anyone in whom you are going to consider intervening, there is an indication to screen. Anybody being treated in order to monitor that treatment effect, and anyone not receiving therapy uh, in whom the decision to treat, uh, the decision that you get or uh, looking at that bone density would cause you to be putting that individual on treatment. <coughs> Women who are discontinuing estrogen will lose bone very rapidly as though they're going through menopause. You might want to consider as that lady is coming off and maybe in her mid 50s to get a bone density because you won't need a baseline. Predictably, she's going to lose, and if she's already starting out low, there may be an indication to, to screen. So well, really, when you look at the NOF criteria, and these are published, you have a tough time finding who shouldn't I screen, uh, looking at all of these. But if you kind of stick to these, these uh, guidelines, you're really not going to get in trouble in terms of who to screen at least once, how frequently they get screened or looked at thereafter, and uh, when they're on therapy, how frequently should they be tested. That's a whole separate issue. This is published by the NOF. It's guidelines that are pretty good guidelines. Most insurance companies will take it. Medicare is still a bit of a, a boondoggle with it, but, uh, but they, they, these are, these are when, uh, when we should screen. Where do we measure? You want to measure the PA spine and hip on all patients. Uh, if occasionally, if a patient's got bilateral hip implants or severe arthritis, you have to use the wrist. That's, that's okay. Primary hyperparathyroidism, the wrist actually gives you more information than the hip or the spine does. And very obese patients, so we, again, will use the wrist because the DEXA limb uh, uh, scanner only can take so much weight on the table. So preferably, we're using DEXA. We're looking in the majority of patients at the spine and the hip, and either one of those can be used, use, uh, utilized uh, using your T-score or Z-score, depending on the age. 
That's a little bit about diagnosis, uh, who it is, what it is, and a little bit about bone densities. I now want to go ahead and spend a little bit of time talking to you about some of the treatment uh, issues that, that I face that I get a lot of questions about. And uh, first issue is who should be treated? And again, this comes from the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Uh, it's published, it's on their website. Postmenopausal women uh, and men over the age of 50, if they have a vertebral fracture um, they, uh, uh, or a hip fracture, either clinically or morphometrically, there's a clear indication to treat that individual. If their T-score is in the osteoporosis range, minus 2.5 or lower at the hip uh, or the femoral neck, uh, make sure they don't have any secondary causes, here's a clear indication to go ahead and treat. So if you get that 55-year-old lady, her T-score is minus 2.6, she's otherwise healthy, no other causes, you've got your indication to go ahead and treat right there. But there's a new one out there that you need to be aware of, and that's utilizing the FRAX tool. Show of hands, who in the audience has used the FRAX tool before? You know, probably about half, maybe a little bit less. Fabulous tool. Up until, oh gosh, three years ago, we didn't have a way of rolling together risk factors to come up with an assessment of whether or not this individual needs to be treated. We were kind of flying by the seat of our pants. But the World Health Organization came out, and I'll show you here in a moment, uh, published this tool called FRAX. It's on the internet. You can Google FRAX, and it'll pull you right in there. And FRAX is a way of, of pulling together all of the risk factors an individual has and spitting out a number to give you a risk uh, assessment of whether or not that patient's going to fracture. And basically, when the NOF has now accepted that if you have a low bone mass and a 10-year fracture, uh, FRAX risk of fracture of greater than 3% at the hip or greater than 20% elsewhere, here is an indication to treat. Now, what do I mean by 3% and 20%? This, incidentally, is a website, but if you Google FRAX, you get there a lot quicker. What this does is it calculates an absolute risk of fracture, not a relative risk, but an absolute risk of fracture, which everybody understands, physicians and, and patients. And here's uh, an, an older picture of, uh, they've updated the website since then, but basically what you're seeing here is a 67-year-old 60, uh, lady, female, her height and her weight are up there. There's a series of questions that you ask the patient. And if you scroll down below on this screen, you'll see all of these questions defined. By previous fracture, we mean atraumatic uh, hip uh, or uh, vertebral fracture. Uh, current smoking is defined if by steroids. We mean the equivalent of five milligrams of prednisone or greater uh, daily for three months or longer. Did the patient's uh, mother or father fracture a hip? These questions are all outlined below. You answer yes or no on them. You put in the actual bone density. You can either use a T-score or if you click on the icon there, you'll see Hologic, Lunar, and Norland, the densitometer, various densitometer companies. And you use the femoral neck bone density. You just actually put the value in there. And then you hit calculate. And what you get is that little red screen that pops up on the bottom. In this case, the individual's risk of a hip fracture is 4.8% in the next 10 years. Risk of a fracture elsewhere is 34%. So here's an indication to treat. This asymptomatic 67-year-old has a value of greater than 3%, value of greater than 20%. Uh, here's an indication to treat. A marvelous tool, because it can be turned around and used to support not treating a patient. A 55-year-old lady who comes in with a T-score of minus 2, who's otherwise healthy, she's questioning, should I be treated or not? If you pull this up and fracture her in front of the patient, you'll find that the risk of fracture is so darn small that she doesn't require intervention. She's going to have more problems with intervention than she is with, with, uh, or than she is with fracturing. And that's reassuring to the patient. I do this a lot for patients to say, look, your overall risk here in the next 10 years is so small, why should we fuss with drugs? Let's keep you off drugs for a few more years. I can buy you some time. Your risk is relatively small. And in due course, you will need treatment. But if I can get you five years off treatment with, uh, with some of these powerful drugs, it's probably worth it. Patients love it. Uh, so you can use it to decide whether or not you should or shouldn't treat. It's simply a tool. It will not tell you what to do. The judgment and the decision ultimately is up to you, but it's a real valuable tool. Now, how do we treat? Uh, back in the good old days when I had 60 minutes to talk to a patient, 45 minutes was spent on this one slide. Uh, yes, we still subscribe to calcium. That's a whole other issue in terms of questions and other issues with calcium, but we still subscribe to it. Most endocrinologists say calcium and vitamin D is a good thing. Yes, we subscribe to exercise, physical activity. You've got to stop the smoking and drinking, both of which make the osteoporosis worse, particularly alcohol in males. Uh, but here's the biggest one, avoiding stress. 
And it's not the stress of me up here talking with you folks or the stress of everybody going home and, and, and arguing with their significant other. It's this kind of stress, physical stress. Well, I point out to patients, you need two things to fracture. A thin bone, you need to do something to it. You're not going to fracture sitting there talking to me. But you know tackle football is going to cause you to fracture. Uh, be careful. Avoid falls. Avoid lifting. Uh, you know, through the years, I, I think I've heard it all. I remember, I recall a lady I saw three or four or five years ago that was 76 years old, and she loved her jogging. I could not get her to stop jogging. Uh, jogging is a repetitive force that hits the uh, hips really hard, leads to fracture the hip fairly frequently. But she loved her jogging. She had pretty significant osteoporosis and wouldn't stop. But to make matters worse, she, uh, she kind of got bored with usual jogging through the years, so she took to jogging backwards. She liked running backwards. Now, in Scottsdale, it gets a little hot in the summertime, so people who are out running or walking tend to do it real early in the morning. So it's not unusual to see people at 4, 30, 5 o'clock in the morning. And sure enough, this lady at 4.30 in the morning, when it's still dark outside, is running down the street backwards. She went over a curb, broke her hip, and all of a sudden, it made sense to her. Now it clicked. She doesn't jog anymore, but uh, that's what it took. And story after story, I could tell you. Now, in terms of pharmacologic intervention, what do we have available to us? Bone is not a quiet organ, as you know. It's constantly changing. Uh, and I apologize this thing when I changed over to a new uh, PowerPoint format. didn't come out quite the way I want. But bone is, is constantly recycled, forming, uh, reabsorbing. Uh, uh, with activation of osteoprogenitor cells, we enter a cycle of bone resorption. The osteoclast digs a little hole into the bone. Two and a half, three weeks later, osteoclast apoptosis occurs. We enter a stage of bone formation with the osteoblast filling in that hole. And three months later, we're right back to square one where we dug a little hole in the bone, filled it up, and resorption and formation are tightly linked. So the net effect is no gain or no loss of bone as we recycle through. It happens in every bone in the body, uh, even the inner ear. Uh, so it's constantly forming and, uh, and reabsorbing bone, is, as you all are well aware. So pharmacologically, where can we intervene? We can intervene here by stopping the osteoclast from doing its thing, or we can intervene here by giving something to tickle the osteoblast to make more bone. It's really the only two spots that we can intervene pharmacologically to affect this cycle to either reduce resorption or increase formation so that we can boost up bone mass. Now, what drugs do we have available to us to do this? These are they. Uh, the anti-resorptive medications, estrogen uh, has been proven, is effective. All of the bisphosphonates, which I'm going to comment on, raloxifene or Avista, calcitonin, nasal calcitonin has pretty much fallen by the wayside. It's a bit of a weak sister. And a new kid that I'll have just a word about at the end, uh, something called denosumab or prolia. These all drugs all act basically the same way. They stop the osteoclast from doing its thing uh, so that we don't resorb bone. Now, the drugs that increase bone formation, we basically have two. Fluoride, and in a nutshell, don't use fluoride. The bone density goes up, but it's structurally abnormal bone. Or parathyroid hormone, the PTH analog, which is out there for tail. Uh, the human uh, 1 to 84 PTH will shortly be available. So PTH will actually build bone back. PTH works differently than the anti-resorptives do. And unfortunately, due to time constraints, I'm not going to have time to, to talk much about that. Rather, what I want to go into is kind of update you with the big guns, the ones that you're all using, the ones that you're aware of, the bisphosphonates, of which there are four available in this country, Alendronate or Fosamax, uh, Residronate, uh, Actinel, Ibandronate, which is Boniva, uh, Zoledronate, um, uh, which is Reclast. In Canada, uh, others are available, Latidronate. In Europe, uh, Clodronate. But all of these are bisphosphonates, and they all essentially do much the same sort of thing. These are the four that are available uh, to us in our in this country. Now, I'm not going to go over how effective they are. You're all aware that the drugs are effective, and the side effects and all the rest. But what I want to update you with is what to expect with some of these things, because you're hearing this from patients, and you're going to hear it from other colleagues. These drugs last a very long time. And uh, as you can see here, take one of these. I'll see you in four years. All of them, all of the bisphosphonates get into bone, and they're there essentially forever, particularly uh, drugs like zoledronic acid, Reclast, uh, Fosmax, uh, Alendronate, they, that, that gets into bone and uh, for the most part it's there for the rest of that individual's life. So very, very long acting medications. That might be good, might be bad, uh, hopefully by the time I'm done you'll have a better feel for it. Because these drugs act so long, one could rationalize maybe if I put a patient on it for a period of time I can stop the drug and I'll still have effect of the drug that will carry out. 
And this has been looked at now with alendronate, and it's also been looked at with residronate, uh, or actin, and the results are much the same. Uh, showing the effect of stopping the drug after a patient's been on it for a long period of time. And the so-called FITFLEX trial was published, came out just a few years ago. Uh, women were randomized uh, to receive alendronate uh, or placebo as part of the FIT trial. At the end of five years, patients on placebo were flipped over, uh, or I'm sorry, patients on alendronate were stopped and, and, uh, and followed for a period of time after that. Uh, patients on placebo continued on placebo, and the endpoints were bone density and, and fractures. Here's what we found on this, this trial. Patients who were put on alendronate for five years, this is what happened with their bone density. I'm sorry, for this one, uh, there was a group that was continued on alendronate and they stayed stable. But at the end of five years, uh, half of these patients were switched over to placebo, and their bone density did go down a little bit for the next five years. The important point is that even though they were on placebo, their bone density drifted down, it didn't go to baseline. It didn't go to where they started uh, originally. Uh, so out here, and looking at the femoral neck bone density, yes, it drifted down just a titch, but it didn't go to baseline. And similarly, when you look at the lumbar spine bone density, we saw the same sort of thing. It went down a bit, but it didn't go down anywhere uh, close to baseline. So after discontinuing the alendronate for five years, having been on it for five years, there was a bit of a decline in bone density. Uh, I won't go into bone marker data with you, but there was no difference between these two groups at the end of five years in terms of fracture rate. So it was because of this study and a similar one shown with Actinel that, it, that we thought it's possible in low-risk patients who are otherwise doing well, after they've been on the drug for five years, we can stop the drug for up to five years, perhaps even longer, because we get the effect of the drug carrying on that long afterwards. Uh, and this is why we introduce this concept of drug holiday now. A lot of uh, people who deal now with osteoporosis are, are doing this. I do it on virtually all my patients, is that after five or six years, if they're stable radiographically, if they're stable clinically, Everything else, the T's are crossed, the I's are dotted, they're on their calcium and the D and they're looking after themselves, uh, we stop the drug. There's no harm done in stopping it and we keep an eye on them. And in fact, the FDA met earlier this year trying to figure out should we put out recommendations about this kind of thing and they all agreed in the FDA panel that yes, we can stop the drug at the end of five years, but what we can't agree on is how long should we leave them off it for and this is unknown at this point. Uh, the current studies we have would suggest you can leave them off for up to five years, perhaps longer, but we don't know how far out this goes. Not only that, the effect may be different for some of the bisphosphonate. Alendronate, very long-lasting. Actinel, uh, residronate, and Boniva, ibandronate, don't last as long. Uh, they're not going to be in bone quite as long as, as alendronate is. Uh, Zoledronate is thousands of times more powerful than any other bisphosphonate we have. And I'm actually concerned with zoledronate because it's going to be in bone and the effect of it is going to be so profound and so long lasting, we do not know what we're doing to those patients in 20 or 30 years. So uh, these are kind of some big unknowns out there is how long should we leave patients off? And uh, if you ask that question, I'm not going to have an answer for you there. Just a brief word about adherence, as with all medications, they're not going to work if patients don't take them. And study after study after study shows the same thing with bisphosphonates. Patients don't take them. You know, 25 to over 50 percent of patients will persist on therapy after one year. So, uh, you know, it means that half to three quarters of your patients after a year uh, aren't taking the medication. Oh, yeah, doc, I'm taking it, and yet they're fracturing. Uh, there are tests we can do, and maybe in the question period I can bring that up to assess whether or not the patient is taking the drug and whether or not they're absorbing it. Obviously, if it's being given intravenously, the patient's taking it because we're giving it to them. But, you know, drugs don't work if, if patients don't take them. And uh, this does result in higher fracture rate, does result in higher costs. Those studies are out there. And I'm sure you can pick any chronic disease and point this out that patients uh, aren't going to take their drugs, but it's particularly true with bisphosphonates for some reason. Even though they're convenient, once a week, once a month, once a year, uh, they're pretty convenient. People have trouble either remembering or just simply adhering to it. Now, a brief word about uh, zoledronate, uh, the power and the beauty, the problem with zoledronate. Uh, IV zoledronic acid, we've been aware of for a long time, uh, gets into bone, lasts a long time. And these were studies by Ian Reed that showed very results on, on bone density with varying doses of IV zoledronate published in 2002, I think it was, yep. Basically what he did was he gave one milligram of zoledronate intravenously uh, every uh, three months, so that's a total of four milligrams in a year. He also did two milligrams every six months, same, same endpoint every six months, or four milligrams once a year. And the results were all the same. 
So here was the first uh, proof that when you look at bone density with a drug that's given as little as four or five milligrams over one year, uh, bone density will go up. So this stuff gets in and it sticks to bone and it takes all of 30 minutes to infuse it. Uh, how, how, how good is that? Did that translate to a reduction in fractures? Yes, it did. Uh, when you look at the vertebral fracture rate, it was cut way down. Hip fracture rate was cut in half. Non-vertebral fractures were, were lowered significantly. And these were well-designed studies, placebo-controlled studies with women over a long period of time that clearly showed the efficacy of one shot of, of uh, zoledronic acid yearly to lower the fracture risk. And it was because of this study that the drug was uh, eventually approved and, and we're now using it. But I've hinted to you earlier, of all of the bisphosphonates we have, here is number one on the list in terms of power. It, it hits bone very, very hard. Is that a good thing or not? And uh, I question this because what are we doing to this lady in 20 years' time? Nobody knows. But I think we have a hint with, uh, with one of the problems that, that we're seeing with one of the other drugs I'm going to show you here in just a moment. But good stuff, it's infused, you know, convenient for the patient. Once a year, I sit in an office for half an hour and get my infusion and I'm good to go for the year. Uh, I don't like using this drug, and I'll show you why here in just a bit, but it does work in patients with GI side effects who cannot tolerate other bisphosphonates. And here's one of the things that I'm worried about, and one of the ones that you all have heard about, you've had questions raised uh, by patients, uh, subtrochanteric fractures. And this one really hit home to me. Uh, earlier this summer when I was seeing a lady in the office who'd been on her Lendronate for a few years and she literally was in tears because she had picked up this magazine and flipped through to an article that I'll show you uh, and said, Doc, what about this? He said, these women are breaking, taking the drug that I'm taking, uh, they're, they're fracturing. And I looked at this magazine and said, I've seen that before. And I ran home, sure enough, my wife subscribes to this, so I, so I pulled it out and I took pictures of it and you go to page 68 and this is what you see, fractured. And what this spends in the next five uh, pages on, on this magazine article, we're going over bisphosphonates and how women all of a sudden are starting to fracture, taking the drugs that are supposed to prevent them from fracturing. So this has hit the lay press big time. And I get questions about this all the time, and I'll bet every doc in this room has dealt with osteoporosis, gets this from patients sooner or later. What about my risk of fracture when I'm taking these drugs? These drugs are going to cause me to fall apart. Why should I take them? Um, Patients are aware of it, lawyers are aware of it. This was pulled out of our Arizona Republic, our big newspaper back last May, and you can see the Fosmax alert because it's been linked to femur fractures, and you know, if you get a fracture, call this guy, he's gonna look after it for you. By the way, there's some defective hip warnings and some knee replacements you need to know as well, but this is in the newspaper, and you can pick any newspaper in the country, you're gonna see this kind of ad. So patients know about it, uh, lawyers certainly know about it. I think uh, we need to know about it. What is this all about? What's going on? This was, uh, I've, unfortunately, I've got a huge osteoporotic pra uh, practice, and I see basically way too much of this. But this is a lady that was referred over to me uh, literally last spring from one of our really astute uh, general internists in the clinic. Lady had been on Fosmax for 10 years, and she was complaining of some thigh pain. Had been present for three or four months. It was just an annoying, achy pain. Uh, and the internist thought, I better get an x-ray of this. It sounds kind of funny, and the internist didn't have an inkling, but uh, this was the x-ray. Now, a very astute radiologist down in our radiology department picked up that there was a problem up here. This doesn't look right, and when you focus in on that, this is what she saw. This is a subtrochanteric fracture about to happen. This lady uh, has pain. Uh, there's a hairline fracture already there. It's been there for a period of time, and it's about to break. And again, I've seen probably, oh gosh, uh, 20 of these patients over the last two or three years with spontaneous fractures of, of, the, uh, of the femur. It does happen. I'll show you how uncommonly it happens, but it does happen. And these are patients on long-term uh, bisphosphonates that have this happen too. Now, when you look at how common this is happening, uh, there are a few studies out there that, that address this issue in patients on bisphosphonates. When you look at hospitalization, U.S. adjusted uh, hospitalization rates for hip fracture over the last uh, several years, the total, total hip fracture rate has actually gone down a lot from 10, 1,000 to 697 per 100,000 population. What we're doing pharmacologically is lowering the overall uh, hip fracture rate when you look at hospitalization rates, but we are seeing subtrochanteric uh, fragility fractures uh, going up. Now look at the absolute numbers here, 1,000 versus 28 awfully small numbers. So yes, we're seeing hip fracture rate coming down. Yes, we're seeing uh, subtrochanteric fractures overall going up. 
thought possibly related to bisphosphonate use, but basically for every hundred hip fractures we're preventing with drugs like bisphosphonates, maybe there's one subtrochanteric fracture that occurs, maybe. And that link isn't clearly established, bisphosphonates versus subtrochanterics, but the, the risk appears to be there. Here's what's been happening with bisphosphonate use over the years as these drugs have taken off since the late uh, 1990s when they were introduced. Here's what's happening to subtrochanteric fracture rate. Doesn't mean one causes the other, but we sure see a nice parallel in terms of, of this going up. Uh, when, where can we expect that we're going to see problems if we see problems with this link? And if patients are on glucocorticoids or protein pump inhibitors and they've been on their bisphosphonates for a long period of time, watch out because that might be a risk factor. They have to be on these drugs usually greater than five years. With less than five years, we're not seeing a link beyond five years. I'll show you in a moment there may be a link. So we're talking about use of bisphosphonates for a long period of time. To date, it's mainly a lendronate, but lendronate's been the one that's been out there the longest. Uh, that's why I'm worried about zolendronate. It's proportionately thousands of times more powerful than a lendronate, and it hasn't been out there that long. Uh, so mainly a lendronate, but others are now being described. Um, there is a unique x-ray appearance I'll show you in a minute. Why do these fractures happen? And this is, uh, this is, nobody knows, I'll tell you at the outset, but in terms of thinking about it, the, think of what these drugs do. The anti-resorptives, the bisphosphonates, stop bone resorption. Resorption and formation are linked. If you stop for a resorption, sooner or later you stop formation. That's what happens. Calcium gets into bone and bone density goes up a little bit, but the two are linked and they're all shut down. Now bone recycling is nature's way of healing microfractures. Everybody in this room, when they're out walking around enjoying New York City, are getting small fractures. Bone remodeling is what fixes those fractures. And there's a concern that if we shut off that remodeling cycle, over time, you're going to get an accumulation of fractures and resulting in a, in a macroscopic fracture. That's all theory. It hasn't been proven yet, but it makes sense to me in terms of what bone remodeling does. The longer you're on the drugs, the longer you shut down that whole cycle, the more microfractures you accumulate, and sooner or later, in a weight-bearing bone like the femur, you get a macrofracture. Pure speculation, but uh, uh, it, it makes sense. Here's what we see. It's a very characteristic uh, x-ray appearance when you x-ray these folks. This is the cortical thickening that occurs, uh, usually a little, occasionally a little hairline fracture. If you actually see the fracture itself, it tends to displace a little bit, and on either side of the fracture, you see this real thick cortis cortices. The radiology that read this report out commented specifically, without knowing the patient, this looks like a pending subtrochanteric fracture is the patient on bisphosphonates. So this was a really astute radiologist that was aware of the distinct radiologic appearance that comes with this. Now how often does it happen? And this is a Swedish study, it's, and it's a very difficult study to read because of the statistics involved and I still have trouble understanding it. But basically when you, it, it was a nested case control study of thousands of patients uh, on, on bisphosphonates, uh, subtrochanteric fracture patients were matched with five controls who did not have such fractures. The risk of the osteoporotic fracture after five years uh, was down, as you would expect, because these patients were on bisphosphonates. But in patients who were treated longer than five years, there was an increased risk of subtrochanteric fractures in patients on bisphosphonates. Now, this was an, a relative risk. It was 2.74. It was significantly up. So the relative risk of having this happen on patients with long U-term use of uh, bisphosphonates is there. But when you look at the absolute numbers, it's vanishingly small. Uh, so the relative risk is real. That's measurable and appears statistically significant. And there's a Canadian study that shows much the same sort of thing. But the absolute risk itself is vanishingly small, and you can see that up there. So you think of the millions of women that these drugs have helped protect from fractures and the very small percentage that we're seeing uh, who develop with subtrochanterics. I think the risk-benefit ratio is pretty obvious on this one. Um, and would I stop the drugs? No. But here's a good argument to stop the drugs after five years because we don't see this effect until after five years. And this is why I'm worried about zoledronate. What are we doing 10 or 20 years from now with a drug that powerful? And that's why I really don't like using it and a lady just for convenience sake. Now switching gears, another one you've all heard about. What about the jaw, doc? Osteonecrosis and, uh, of the jaw and bisphosphonates. And again, anybody who's dealt with these drugs gets asked this question over and over again. Is there a link? Mark Twain answered this best. And, uh, and I think we all feel the same on this one. I'm gonna answer properly and say, I don't know. Uh, that one I can't, can't, uh, can't be sure, but let me show you the data that we have. <clears throat> 
I don't know it, but our lawyers sure know it again. Same newspaper, Arizona Republic. Bear in mind that osteonecrosis of the jaw was first described in 2003. It's that uncommon. I mean, bisphosphonates came out, and then finally we had ONG and bisphosphonates. That was 2003. I pulled this out of the newspaper in 2006. So it didn't take the lawyers long to catch on to this. And uh, here you go, call Phillips. He'll look after your uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw. Now, why does it happen? Again, bisphosphonates reduce bone turnover, this, question, this concept of so-called frozen bone. Uh, you take a, a, a bone like the jaw, which is repetitively being used, and you cover it with a very thin mucous membrane. You use it a lot. You start to get microfractures in there. Uh, that membrane breaks down. There's a setup for infection. This is some of the thoughts in terms of why, uh, why this occurs. It's just trauma plus infection uh, over a period of time. And this is kind of what it looks like. If, uh, these uh, pictures are actually from chemotherapy patients. These are not osteoporotic patients, or uh, osteoporotic patients. These are chemotherapy patients treated with zoledronate, uh, where it, it is common in uh, perhaps up to 5%, um, maybe more, maybe less, uh, of chemotherapy patients with zoledronate who are getting these drugs in very high doses once a month. They're getting them very frequently. And it's basically just denuded dead bone. Uh, it can be very uncomfortable. This is a case that's very, very difficult to treat. Here's a particularly bad case of a lady whose whole lower mandible is basically involved, and uh, this is a surgical mess trying to, trying to clean this out and put, reconstruct it and put it back together again. So it really is not a very nice thing when it happens. Um, but in terms of how, I'm going to go back to the previous slide here, how commonly does it occur? Uh, our best guess estimate, best guess in osteoporotic patients being treated with bisphosphonates is perhaps 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000. That's what we're looking at. So it's very, very uncommon in the osteoporotic patient treated with bisphosphonates. How do, when do you uh, look for it? If a patient's complaining of any jaw problems, examine the mouth, go in, look at the mouth. If there's a concern, get it off to see the oral surgeon. Uh, we do recommend to patients, if they require any oral uh, major dental work, to get it done prior to going on bisphosphonates. If they're already on bisphosphonates and their dentist refuses to do work on them, send them back to see another dentist. The American Dental Association has already stated in their own guidelines that if a patient is on bisphosphonates and work needs to be done, do it. There is no point in stopping the bisphosphonates and waiting a month or two to do the dental work because, as I've shown you, bisphosphonates last forever in terms of their effect. So uh, we like to do the major dental work ahead of time, but if things pop up afterwards and uh, it needs to be worked on, go ahead and work on it. In fact, I've talked with our oral surgeon about this, and he says that if a patient needs a crown or needs a root canal and they're on bisphosphonates, say bisphosphonates, and the dentist is dragging his feet, he said, Get a new dentist because, in point of fact, if you leave it, if you don't do something about it, you're guaranteed you're going to have a problem. So fix it now, even though they're on the bisphosphonates, and we encourage the dentist, uh, please don't worry about it. Um, there's not much you can do about it because it's going to be in the, in the drug's going to be in there forever. But it's very, very uncommon. You know, one in 100,000 is not enough to really worry about. I've have been dealing with these drugs now for 15 years. I've had a huge osteoporotic practice, and I've seen it once in all those years. So it's, you know, anecdotes don't count but the data are out there in terms of, of how uncommon this is. Now, in terms of what's new, I'm going to close off here. We should have some time for, for questions. I want to have just a brief word about the new kid on the block, uh, denosumab or prolia. Uh, it's a new one that's out there. I think probably most everybody's heard about it but isn't, uh, isn't aware of what it is. It, it, like all the others, it's an anti-resorptive uh, medication. And what prolia is, is a, is a rank ligand, a monoclonal antibody to rank ligand. Now, rank ligand, I won't go into this in great detail, is, is a cytokine that stimulates osteoclast uh, formation, osteoclast differentiation, osteoclast activation. So it's a, it's a very important ligand in terms of getting the osteoclast to go. Uh, denosumab is a mono, human monoclonal antibody to that, to that cytokine, and it basically stops the rank ligand from working. It does not, it therefore uh, prevents uh, osteoclast uh, formation, osteoclast activation. It's given by injection, 60 milligrams subcutaneously, so again, we give it, and it's done in the doctor's office. The effect is very rapid. It hits within days in terms of stopping that osteoclast from working, and it lasts for about three to six months. The uh, best data we have suggests it lasts for a maximum of six months. So unlike bisphosphonates, denosumab is in and it's out 
It doesn't have the long-term effects on bone because it's not accumulating in bone. Does it work? Yes, it works well. Compared to a lendronate, it maybe works a little bit better. Uh, there's, at least with published data, no significant adverse events that we're aware of. It will reduce fracture rate. It is out there. It is approved for treatment. The problem with denosumab is that it's biologic and it has widespread effects elsewhere in the body. It's an immune modulator to some extent. It can affect the uh, possibility of, of white blood cell function. There's been a concern about infections with the, regards to the medication. Uh, it just has a number of other effects throughout the body that we're not quite sure on. So this one's kind of a second line drug. We're using it and we're actually using it a lot. And where I'm using it is in patients with chronic kidney disease, stage four uh, disease, even to some extent stage three chronic kidney disease. If there's a reluctance to use bisphosphonates in those patients, then Prolia actually works fairly well on those patients. And we've got control on it. It's given every six months. And as I say, to date, no significant adverse events. It's been out about a year and a half now. Uh, it's relatively uh, inexpensive as these drugs go. Uh, and I think as time goes on, you're going to be seeing a lot more use of Prolia because, again, it's convenient for the patient. It's every six months, uh, which patients really like. This is the fracture data uh, uh, with denosumab. Uh, it was published uh, just, uh, oh gosh, it uh, came out a couple of years ago now, but it was what allowed the drug to be released. And again, like the bisphosphonates, it overall reduces the risk of fracture about 50% or so. Across the board, bisphosphonates will reduce risk of fracture about 50%. Denosumab reduces about 50%. PTH analog, Forteo, reduces risk of fracture about 50% when you just kind of ballpark all of this. So all these drugs reduce the risk of fracture significantly, but they don't take the risk to zero. That's still up to you to talk with the patient about being careful and looking after themselves and doing these other things to lower their risk of fracture. So what do I do to summarize all of this? And we should have time for some questions here. There are a lot of morbidity and costs associated with osteoporosis. The boomers are moving up. We can expect to see it in the not-too-distant future. We are part of the problem. Please uh, start mobilizing. Just think in point of fact that if I can make one small change now, just get that patient to take calcium and, mu and multiply that by the 40 million people that are expected to have this problem in the next few years, big difference in terms of morbidity and costs. Osteoporosis and osteopenia are well-defined terms. Uh, they have a place when, uh, and, and, they, and they are misused. I constantly get consults. Uh, what about this 35-year-old fellow with osteoporosis? He doesn't have osteoporosis. He's got something else and we need to sort it out. I've gone over the indications for bone density tests, uh, testing, the indications for treating, and the FRAX applicability and, uh, applicability and go Google, Google FRAX and play with it. It's really a fun tool to play with. The drug holiday rationale uh, covered in terms of why we're stopping these medications after a period of time. Adherence as with any chronic disease is problematic. I've gone over briefly IV bisphosphonate use with you. ONJ is rare enough uh, to forget about. Subtrochanteric fractures, extremely rare as, as well. And if you're stopping the medications after five or six years, you probably never will have that problem. And denosumab is really a new uh, therapeutic option that we do have available to us. And that brings me back to the last slide here. If I haven't uh, convinced you, or if I, I hope I haven't, or I hope I've confused you, but I'm going to stop there, and we should have some time, probably about 10 minutes or so, for questions. Back on track, Jan. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. Is it you tell, treat them for five years, you measure your bone density, is there a rationale for adding in another agent? No, it doesn't make sense because you're adding in another uh, anti-resorptive. They're already on an anti-resorptive with the Fosamex that's left in their bone. And I see this over and over. Well, let's stop your Fosamex and put you on a Vista. It doesn't make sense. They're on an anti-resorptive because the Fosamex is already there. Uh, the patient that you stop who is failing therapy, their bone density suddenly goes down or they start to fracture, those are the ones that you consider putting on a different agent entirely, and there I will go over to the analogs and put them on for tail. Questions? Uh, there was some over here. Yes, ma'am. 
Yeah, the vitamin D issue, that's a whole talk that I could spend an hour going over up here again. Vitamin D is kind of an interesting one. Yes, we do subscribe to it, in spite of what uh, a lot of literature may say. And the vitamin D replete patient, uh, anywhere from uh, the uh, IOM currently says 600 units a day is adequate. Uh, most of us end recommend 800 to 1,000 units a day. The 50,000 units uh, dose, the pharmacologic dose, can be taken once a month. And that's kind of convenient for patients because when you do the arithmetic, that ends up being around 1,500 units or so a day. Uh, and I do have a number of patients who like to take it once a month like that. But 50,000 units a week or twice a week, I mean, if somebody who's vitamin D replete, no, that doesn't make an awful lot of sense because it increases the urine calcium load. You run the remote risk of vitamin D intoxication. Uh, so just over the counter, uh, most folks do just fine if they're vitamin D replete. Uh, if they're vitamin D insufficient, then you might need to fill up the tank and then switch them to over the counter. But constantly using 50,000 units once a week or something, uh, there are risks associated with that, so we don't recommend it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. That kind of raises the big question of uh, the question being uh, aren't uh, biomarkers for following these patients, particularly on a drug holiday. I didn't show you the biomarker data on, the, on that FitFlex study, but the biomarkers do tend to increase a little bit over time, uh, not where they were as if they had never been treated. We don't use the biomarkers in the, in the clinical standpoint because I don't think we understand them that well, and there's so much variability with the biomarkers that, uh, that they're, they're a great research tool, but as a clinical tool, we don't use them at all. So I wouldn't use that to follow them. I would use what the patient's telling me and the bone density to guide me. The biomarkers are just inherently kind of volatile and difficult to interpret, and we don't know what that one means clinically. Now, where I do use the biomarkers and where they're really helpful is that somebody says, yeah, I'm taking my Fosmax, and they're coming in, and they're breaking bones. And the question is, are they really taking the Fosmax or not? There, a 24-hour urine uh, NTX is helpful. If the NTX is suppressed, they're taking it and they're absorbing it. If their NTX is up in a premenopausal range where it shouldn't be, then either they're not taking it or they're not absorbing it, and nine times out of 10, it's because they're not taking it. So that's pretty much the only time I use the urinary biomarkers is to tell me whether or not the patient's taking the drug. Been real helpful from that standpoint. You have time, but let me ask you to come down here yeah. because Dr. Fisher needs to get, get set up. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So another question over there in the back. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Now you can't have to yell that one on any rat cut. Is there any rationale for? <laughs> starting, starting a bisphosphonate prophylactically in a patient that is on prednisone. Yeah. Yeah. The arimidex issue, no. Uh, that one, uh, we don't have any good information on at all. The steroid issue, yes. I think there's a, if a patient is going to be on steroids for a long period of time, particularly if they're a little bit older, a lot of, uh, there is a good rationale for starting a bisphosphonate early to prevent that steroid effect. But the arimidex one is kind of out there, right? We wouldn't recommend it just yet. And that's regardless of the baseline Yep, yep. Sir. What about him? Calcium supplements and the increased risk for cardiovascular. Yeah, you know, that, that's out there. And uh, I don't know an endocrinologist or even our society that subscribes to that. Uh, all, you pretty much all of us would say 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day is going to be safe. It's not going to cause urine kidney stones for the most part, in spite of what the Women's Health Initiative says. Uh, and, and it's out there. Is it a concern? Yes. Is it merit looking at? Yes. Is it going to change how I practice? No, not yet. Sir? Yeah. What's the statement? Can you repeat it? Yeah. All Americans are a little bit calcium deficient. Yeah, yeah. Both. Calcium and D. Uh, vitamin D deficiency, depending on where you set the level at, is endemic in this country. If you set a level 25 hydroxy D of 30, uh, over half uh, of postmenopausal women are going to have a value of less than 30. 
Uh, and it's around somewhere between 20 and 30 that vitamin D deficiency starts to stimulate parathyroid production, and that's what increases bone turnover and leads to the osteoporosis. So somewhere in that 20 to 30 range, we're looking at a problem, and uh, that's a very, very common issue in this country. What's not settled is whether or not putting patients on vitamin D to get above 30 is going to make a big difference. Most of us feel that it will, but that's still open, and there is a big study underway to look at that very issue right now. Sir, you had a question. You mean stop it after five years? Why doesn't the risk just stay, stay where it is if they last forever? I would expect this to Because we haven't studied it out past there. That's all. <laughs> they, it probably does last a lot longer, but we haven't studied it beyond that. That's all. Do you, do you order 25? Tums, you're right, Tums is pure calcium carbonate, great way to get, get calcium in. Well, we're seeing the calcium issue in the uh, stomach is the PPIs, uh, because they reduce uh, uh, gastric acid secretion and you need acid to, to absorb calcium. So there may be a link there with PPIs and bone issues that's being explored pretty vigorously right now. Yeah. Yeah. So recently I had a patient uh, well known to me, uh, my wife, whose physician ordered a 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Quest Diagnostic billed me $240. My insurance told me I had not met my deductible. She could help me for it. $240. She would be ordering 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I think you need to find another lab, Jan. <laughs> that's, that's, that's even pricier than us. <laughs> Maybe, I, think, I, I have a call in from a pathologist who is uh, in charge of Quest. I, I should. Do a lot of work with Quest. Yeah. Yeah. You ask a good question, and right now it is not recommended for screening, no. Uh, and, and do I do it? I do it in a lot of my patients, uh, but there's no science behind that. And, uh, but it's not recommended, no, as a workup uh, for the osteoporotic, it's not recommended. How many of you are ordering 25 hydroxy vitamin D as no. a measure of health in patients in your family medicine or internal medicine practice? Raise your hand. That's no surprise. If you'd asked the same question 10 years ago, hardly anybody would have put up their hands. In terms of lab utilization, the, probably one of the, the one test that's really taken off over the last few years is 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and there isn't much science behind that. <laughs> Caught on like wildfire. I, I, I bet you look into the fact that there's no evidence. There's a lot of observation. It's associated with everything. Yep. No. Sir. Actually, that's a, that's a huge question because it covers so much ground. But in a nutshell, if you're seeing somebody with a D deficiency uh, of less than 10, there's usually a reason for it. You need to go look at it. There's a patient that, until proven otherwise, has sprue, asymptomatic sprue. So go looking for it when you see a D that level, that low. Does it mean we're not going to treat with other, uh, if she has osteoporosis? No. I'm going to put her on whatever anti-resorptive I'm going to put her on, but I'm also going to fill up her vitamin D tank. But just make sure you're not missing a cause for a D level that low. But Jan's point is very well taken about the science behind vitamin D. It's caught on, it's snowballed, and there's not much science behind this at all. As a screening test in healthy no. people, you talk about an osteoporotic patient, totally no. different. Ma'am? You know, that's a great, great issue of uh, patients, and I was guilty of the same thing myself, uh, pa putting patients with osteopenia on basically prophylactic bisphosphonates um, until Frax came out. And this is where Frax has really helped with the physician and with the patient. Now you've got something objective that's accepted in the scientific community to say that no, we do not need to be treating these patients prophylactically because of the long-term effects which currently aren't known. So that's been real helpful to kind of stamp out that prophylactic use of medications as powerful as bisphosphonates.